Welcome back to the Lily's Viking Adventure Show. Thank you for joining me. I have an amazing show for you today. I got with an author who has a book and they're about to publish it through ebooks. And he is, he sent me some blips and blurbs to read to you guys. I'm very excited about it. Uh, the writing is fantastic, and there's so many of our authors that. Uh, don't have a lot of big showing so I wanted and this is going to be the first he's posts posted some to Facebook but this is going to be the first live reading I believe of his work and so when it does come out on ebook uh, please definitely support him uh, buy the book if you enjoy this and I will make a link to his Facebook in the description of this video so go friend him he is also a craftsman and so he makes a lot of really cool Norse things so check him out definitely and it is very cool that he has allowed me to read some of this for you guys so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about him first and then I will start reading He's given me about 35 pages to read, and so I might have to cut this into two parts. We'll see how it goes, but I'm going to try that. Um, before I get started, please like, subscribe, share the channel, make a comment. Um, tell me what you think of his writing and the things that he has to say in the comments and support the channel the only thing i really need is you know get give me a like and it helps put me into those algorithms to get shared with a wider audience and it really helps me out and helps the channel grow so if you haven't subscribed please do that um, and uh, we'll get started thank you for joining me so i'm going to tell you a little bit about the author here his name is cornelius and he is a German-born craftsman, researcher, and passionate explorer of Norse traditions, and he currently resides in a small village in the Netherlands. He is deeply fascinated by the magic and mysticism of the Viking Age. Cornelius has dedicated much of his life to studying the spiritual practices, rituals, and beliefs of the ancient Norse people. His work focuses on making these old world traditions accessible and relevant to contemporary audiences. Whether they are scholars, spiritual practitioners, or simply lovers of myth and history. When he is not researching or writing, Cornelius spends his time creating handcrafted tools, amulets, and implements for witches, shamans, and modern day practitioners <clears throat> of Norse magic. Through his artistry, he brings the past to life, using traditional techniques and materials to forge unique pieces, inspired by ancient designs. His creations, which range from rune-inscribed charms to ritual staffs, are deeply rooted in the old ways, blending historical accuracy with modern spiritual needs. Through his research, craftsmanship, and writing, Cornelius Engelhart aims to honor the wisdom of the old gods and the legacy of the Norse, inviting others to explore and experience the magic that still resonates from the ancient world. So we're going to take a look first at chapter two. It's called The Weavers of Fate, Seers, Sorcerers, and Magic Practitioners. In the Viking Age, the world was alive with forces that shaped the lives of gods and humans alike. The Norse people believed that destiny, or weird, was woven by unseen hands, a tapestry spun by beings who could perceive the future and manipulate the threads of fate. Those who practiced were known as Saidamen, sorcerers, and Fulur, seeresses, the weavers of fate. These practitioners of magic wielded powers that could harm or heal, foretell the future, and even influence the outcome of battles. 
They were both revered and feared, possessing knowledge that could traverse the boundaries of the unknown and the known. This chapter delves into the lives and practices of the magic wielders of Viking Age Scandinavia, those individuals who were believed to possess the ability to see beyond the veil of reality and to weave fate itself. These weavers of fate were as varied as the magic they practiced, from the prophetic visions of the Valur to the rune magic of the Galdermen and the shamanic rites of the Seidwurkers. By examining their roles, their rituals, and their influence, we can begin to understand how magic shaped Norse society and the Viking worldview. The Volva, prophetess of the North, among the most respected and feared practitioners in the Viking Age, Scandinavia was the Volva, a female Sirius who held a unique place in society. The word Volva means wand wielder or staff bearer. Reflecting her connection to the sacred tools that facilitated her magic, the vulva was considered a bridge between the human and the divine, able to communicate with gods, spirits, and the dead. She wielded Said, a form of magic that involved prophecy, spirit, journeying, and sometimes even weather manipulation or curses. The vulva was a highly trained practitioner whose power came from her ability to enter altered states of consciousness. This often involved complex rituals where she would sit on a high platform or special seat, often called a scythe holler, surrounded by a circle of chanting women who helped induce her trance state. The chanting combined with Rhythmic drumming or singing was believed to assist her in reaching a spiritual realm where she could commune with supernatural beings and receive visions. In these trance-like states, the vulva would see beyond the present, accessing the threads <clears throat> of fate woven by the Norns and offering insights or predictions that could influence decisions ranging from everyday matters to major political or military actions. This made her both a sought-after advisor and a potentially dangerous figure, as her words could sway leaders, influence public opinion, and alter the course of events. <clears throat> the Saga of Fjordburg, a vulva's power. One of the most detailed descriptions of a vulva's practice comes from the saga of Eric the Red. In this saga, a vulva named Thjörborg is invited to a Greenlandic farmstead to perform a ritual and foretell the future during a time of famine. She arrives dressed in fine, fine garments, adorned with charms and jewels, and carrying a staff topped with brass. She is given a seat of honor, and preparations are made for her ritual. During the ritual, Thjordborg is surrounded by a group of women who sing a chant known as Vardlokur to help her enter a trance. Once in this altered state, Thjordborg is able to commune with the spirits and foresee an end to the famine, predicting favorable conditions in the coming season. Her predictions bring relief and hope to the community demonstrating the profound influence a vulva could have on her society. However, the power of the vulva could also provoke fear and suspicion. The ability to foresee the future, summon spirits, or curse enemies meant that the vulva was often seen as a figure who could wield significant influence over the community. In some cases, this made her a target for accusations of witchcraft or manipulation, particularly during times of conflict or social tension. The role of the vulva in society. The vulva occupied a space on the periphery of Norse society, respected and consulted for her abilities, but also kept at a distance due to the fear of her power. Unlike Christian priests, who became increasingly influential in later periods, the vulva was a product of a society that respected the old gods. 
the spirits of the land, and the ancient ways. She did not belong to any organized religions, religious institution, but instead operated as an independent practitioner, often traveling from village to village and being compensated for her services with gifts or hospitality. The vulva was not only a spiritual leader, but also a healer, a political advisor, and at times a warrior. Her role could vary greatly depending on the needs of her community and her own skills and abilities. In some instances, she would act as a mediator between conflicting parties, using her prophetic skills to foresee potential outcomes and guide decision making. In other cases, she might use her power to aid warriors in battle, casting spells to ensure victory or protect against curses. Her staff, often elaborately carved and decorated, was a symbol of her authority and connection to the divine. It was believed that the staff enabled her to travel between worlds, guiding her spirit as it journeyed through the realms. Some volur were even buried with their staffs, a testament to the belief that their power extended beyond death. Saidman and the Shamanic Tradition while the vulva was a prominent figure in Viking Age magic, she was not the only practitioner of Scyther. Male practitioners, known as Scythemen, also existed. Though their involvement in Scyther was often viewed with ambivalence or suspicion, unlike the vulva, whose practice was more accepted due to its association with feminine power, the Scythemen had to navigate social stigma as the use of scythe by men was sometimes considered unmanly or dishonorable. However, this did not prevent some men, including powerful leaders and warriors, from practicing scythe. The god Odin himself was known to use scythe, which he learned from Freya, despite the societal taboo. Odin's use of scythe highlighted his relentless pursuit of wisdom and power even if it meant crossing traditional gender boundaries or engaging in practices deemed shameful by others. The Scythemen were often more focused on shamanic practices, particularly in entering altered states to communicate with spirits, seek guidance from the gods, or engage in spiritual battles. Their rituals might involve chanting, drumming, dancing, or the use of intoxicating substances to induce trance states. The boundary between the physical and spiritual realms was fluid in these practices, and the Scythemen were believed to have the ability to cross this boundary at will. Gotta have my kava juice. The sagas provide several cautionary tales of male practitioners of Scyther. One such tale is found in the saga of the Lakstala, which recounts the story of Kotkal, a Saidmadr, who, along with his family, is accused of using Saidr to bring misfortune upon his enemies. Kotkal and his wife, Grima, use their magic to summon a storm that wrecks a ship belonging to a rival, resulting in the deaths of many men. The saga portrays Kotkol as a figure of both fear and scorn, a reminder of the potential dangers associated with male practitioners of Scyther. His story illustrates the ambivalence with which Scythemen were often regarded powerful and dangerous, yet marginalized and treated with suspicion. While the vulva was more accepted due to her role in prophecy and healing, the Scythemen were often viewed as meddling in forbidden arts, challenging societal norms. Nevertheless, the use of Scyther by both men and women underscored the belief in its eff efficacy and the desire to harness its power regardless of the risks. The Galdarmen, Masters of Spoken Magic The Galdarmen, or Singers of Spells, were practitioners of a different kind of magic gulder. This form of magic, rooted in the spoken and sung word, 
focused on the power of incantations and runes to bring about specific outcomes. The Galdermen were often seen as poets or bards with a special talent for language, and they wielded words with a skill that could influence both gods and men. Galdar spells could be used for a wide variety of purposes, from healing to protection, love to cursing. The effectiveness of a Galdar spell was believed to depend on the precision of its words, the skill of the practitioner, and the alignment of the spell with cosmic forces. Galdar was not confined to a single gender. Both men and women could be Galdarmen. Though it was more commonly associated with male poets, skalds, and warriors, the Galdarmen often combined their vocal incantations with the use of runes, creating a powerful synergy between sound and symbol. Runes were carved into wood, stone, or metal, and then activated through Galdar. This combination was thought to enhance the potency of the spell, drawing on the ancient powers of runes as well as the magic of the spoken word. Egil Skala Grimson, a poet and a sorcerer. One of the most famous Galdermen in Norse literature is Egil Skala Grimson, a legendary poet, warrior, and sorcerer. Egil is best known for his prowess in battle and his sharp wit, and he was also a master of Galdr. In Egil's saga, we see Egil use his poetic and magical skills to craft powerful curses, heal the sick, and protect himself from enemies. One notable episode involves Egil carving a rune-inscribed stave to cure a woman who had been ill for a long time. Upon examining the original rune stave placed under her bed, he realizes it was carved incorrectly, causing her sickness. He destroys the faulty stave and carves a new one with the correct runes, chanting a galdr as he does so, and the woman is miraculously healed. In another instance, Egil crafts a curse against King Erik Bloodaxe and his queen Gunhild who have exiled him. He carves a rune stave, inscribes it with the runes of misfortune, and places it in an open field where it can be seen by the gods. He then recites a curse in poetic form, invoking the powers of fate and the gods to bring ruin upon his enemies. Eckel's mastery of both poetry and magic illustrates the close relationship between the two arts in Norse society the ability to wield words with precision and intent was a powerful skill, capable of swaying hearts, winning battles, and bending the will of the gods themselves. Herbalists and Healers and The Magic of Nature While the Valur and Galdermen often held a spotlight in the sagas and myths, there were many other practitioners who engaged in more practical forms of magic. Herbalists, healers, and cunning folk, often re referred to as Leknir or Vitki, worked with the natural world to harness its healing properties. They combined practical knowledge of herbs and remedies with spiritual and magical practices such as charms, spells, and rituals to heal ailments, protect from harm, and ward off evil. These practitioners were deeply connected to the land and its spirits, often performing rituals and offerings to ensure the favor of the Landvetr, land spirits, and other supernatural beings. They would collect herbs at specific times of day or during particular lunar phases, believing that the alignment of natural forces would enhance the plant's potency. The Saga of the Icelanders, Healing and Cursing. Several sagas provide insights into the work of these magic practitioners. In the saga of the people of Vatnastal, a woman named Liot, the Pale, is known for her skill in healing and magic. When a young man named Hirolif 
is injured in a battle, Lyot is called upon to heal him. She uses a combination of herbal remedies and spoken charms to cure his wounds, a practice common among Norse healers. <clears throat> However, not all such practitioners were benevolent. In Gisli's saga, an old woman named Odbjörg is described as a powerful sorceress who uses her knowledge of herbs and magic to curse her enemies. She creates a potion using herbs gathered under the full moon and recites a dark incantation, causing misfortune and illness to befall her rivals. Her actions underscore the dual nature of Norse magic, which could be used for both healing and harm. Herbalists and healers occupied a unique space within Viking Age society. They were often revered for their knowledge and skills, but they could also be viewed with suspicion, especially in times of crisis, when their magic was blamed for misfortunes or illnesses. This delicate balance of respect and fear mirrors the broader Viking understanding of magic as a potent force that could be both a blessing and a curse. The Sorcerers of the Sea <clears throat> Magic at the Margins In addition to the land-based practitioners of magic, there were those who operated on the margins of Viking society. Sailors, traders, and adventurers who practiced a form of magic unique to the sea. The Norse were a seafaring people and the ocean was both a lifeline and a source of danger. The sea was unpredictable, governed by its own set of spirits and gods, and those who navigated it often relied on magic to ensure safe passage and success in their endeavors. These sea sorcerers, known as Saidman or Vitkar, of the waves, specialized in weather magic, summoning winds, calming storms, and protect, protecting ships from danger. They would use charms, runes, and even blood sacrifices to appease the spirits of the sea, often invoking gods like Njord and the god of the sea, the god of the sea and wind, or Egir, the god of the ocean. Sea magic in the sagas. The saga of the Jams Vikings provides a vivid example of sea magic. In the saga, a Viking chieftain named Sigvaldi and his men find themselves caught in a terrible storm at sea. Desperate, they seek help of a powerful sorceress named Katla, who performs a ritual to calm the waves and steer their ships safely to shore. She uses a combination of runes, chants, and offerings to the sea gods to achieve her ends, demonstrating the intricate and varied nature of sea magic. Another example can be found in the saga of the Greenlanders, where sailors invoke sea gods for safe passage across the treacherous waters of the North Atlantic. Before setting sail, they make offerings and sacrifices to ensure favorable winds and calm seas, relying on both divine favor and practical seafaring knowledge to survive the journey. The practice of sea magic illustrates the depth of Norse engagement with the supernatural, showing that magic was not confined to any one domain or aspect of life. It permeated all corners of their existence, from the deep forests and high mountains to the vast uncharted waters. The weavers of fate and the fabric of Norse magic. The magic practitioners of the Viking Age, Valur, Saidman, Galdrman, herbalists, and sea sorcerers, were the weavers of fate, individuals who could tap into the unseen forces of the cosmos and influence them or the world around them. Their practices were as diverse as they were powerful, encompassing prophecy, runic magic, healing, curses, and more. Each of these practitioners operated within a complex mm -hmm. web of social norms, 
religious beliefs, and personal abilities. Some, like the Valur, were revered and respected, while others, like the Saidaman, were viewed with suspicion and fear. Yet all of them played a crucial role in Norse society, providing guidance, protection, and at times, retribution. Their stories remind us that the Norse world was not just one of warriors and raiders, but also of poets, seers, healers, and sorcerers, individuals who sought to understand, interpret, and shape the mysteries of the universe. These weavers of fate were a testament to the Norse belief in the power of magic and the possibility of altering one's destiny, even in the face of forces far beyond human control. As we continue our exploration of Norse magic and mysticism, we gain a deeper appreciation for the rich tapestry of beliefs that defined the Viking Age and its people. Chapter 2, The Weavers of Fate Seers, Sorcerers, and Magic Practitioners in the Viking Age, the world was alive with forces that shaped the lives of gods and humans alike. Origins and Nature of Scythe The word scythe is somewhat elusive in its precise meaning, but it broadly refers to a type of magic involving altered states of consciousness and ecstatic trance. Scythe was not merely an intellectual or spiritual exercise, it was a form of shamanism that required the practitioner to connect with the invisible forces that shaped the cosmos. Through Scythe, one could communicate with spirits, invoke gods, see into the future, and even influence the state of individuals or communities. Origins of Scythe are thought to predate the Viking Age with roots in older Germanic and possibly pre-Germanic shamanistic practices. Some scholars suggest a connection to Sami shamanism, given the similarities in trance techniques and spirit journeying. Scythe could be used for both benevolent purposes, such as healing and prophecy, and malevolent ones like curses and manipulation, reflecting its dual nature as a powerful and dangerous form of magic. The Vulva, Weaver of Fate and Mistress of Magic The Vulva was the quintessential practitioner of Scythe and held a unique place in Norse society. Unlike the male warriors or the chieftains who dominated the sagas, the Vulva existed outside the typical social hierarchies. She was a wandering seeress, healer and prophetess who could be called upon in times of need. She was a woman who wielded spiritual authority and was both revered and feared for her abilities to navigate the unknown realms of magic. The term vulva itself means staff carrier, highlighting the centrality of the staff in her practice. This staff was not merely a walking aid, but a potent symbol of her magical power and her ability to traverse the worlds. The staff was elaborately carved with animal motifs, spirals, or runic inscriptions, each element adding to its magical potency. The staff was thought to be a conduit for the vulva's spiritual power, allowing her journey to journey between realms, communicate with spirits, and weave the threads of fate. The vulva staff, a symbol of power and magic. The vulva staff was the most distinguishing feature of the vulva and was more than just a tool. It was an extension of her power and a representation of her connection to the divine and mystical realms. Staffs found in archaeological contexts have revealed a variety of shapes and designs, indicating that these were not mass-produced items, but uniquely crafted artifacts that held deep personal and spiritual significance for their owners. The design of these staffs often included symbolic elements that enhanced their magical function. For example, some staffs were topped with a finial, shaped like a horse's head or a bird, animals that were believed to possess special powers or serve as guides in the otherworldly journeys. 
Others were engraved with runes or symbols associated with protection, wisdom, or prophecy. The staff was not just a physical object. It was a magical tool that played a crucial role inside the ritual. Historic examples of vulva staffs in archaeology. Archaeological evidence has provided fascinating insights into the use and significance of the vulva staffs. Several remarkable examples have been discovered in burial sites across Scandinavia, offering a glimpse into the lives and practices of these powerful women. <clears throat> the Osseberg Burial, Norway. One of the most famous Viking Age burials that provided evidence of the vulva and her staff is the Osseberg Burial Mound in Norway, dated to around 834 CE. The Osseberg ship burial is considered one of the richest archaeological finds from the Viking Age, containing two female skeletons, numerous grave goods, and a wealth of artifacts. Among the items found were a beautifully carved wooden staff with intricate designs that suggest its magical significance. The staff from the Osseberg burial has a unique hook-like shape which has led some scholars to interpret it as a magical staff or a vulva staff. The fact that it was placed prominently among other ritual items, such as a wooden cart, weaving tools, and a tapestry, depicting a possible procession or ritual, supports the idea that this staff was used in magical or religious practices. The burial also contained seeds of the cannabis plant, which some scholars believe may have been used in rituals to induce trance states, further indicating the presence of a vova or a practitioner of Scythe in the burial. The Firkat Grave, Denmark. Another notable find comes from the grave of a woman at the Viking fortress of Firkat in Denmark, dated to the late 10th century. This grave contained a wealth of grave goods, including a staff made of iron with a bulbous end. This iron staff is often interpret interpreted as a vulva staff due to its unique shape and the context in which it was found. The grave also contained a pouch of henbane seeds, a psychoactive plant known to be used in rituals and magic, which supports the interpretation of this woman as a practi practitioner of scythe. The iron staff's distinctive design with a knobbed top suggests it may have been used to mark boundaries between worlds or to conduct spirits during rituals. The fact that the staff was made of iron, a metal often believed to repel evil spirits, further indicates its protective and ritual function. This grave also contained animal bones, amulets, and other ritual items providing a compelling example of a vulva burial and the significance of her staff. <clears throat> the staff from Ligier grave, Denmark. In 2009, archaeologists uncovered another fascinating vulva burial at Ligier, Denmark. The grave, dating to the 9th or 10th century, included a bronze-coated wooden staff that had been broken in half before burial a common practice in Norse graves to symbolize the release of the object's power. The staff featured a bird-like finial at the top, which has been interpreted as a reference to the spirit animals that would guide a vulva on her shamanic journeys. This staff, alongside a collection of other ritual objects, including a box containing white lead, hazelnuts, and seeds, suggests that the woman buried here was engaged in complex magical practices the breaking of the staff could symbolize the release or neutralization of its power, ensuring that the vulva's spirit did not remain attached to it after death. The bird motif on the finial also aligns with the concept of filgir, or spirit animals in Norse belief, which were thought to accompany practitioners on their spiritual journeys. Rituals of Scyther Entering the other world and shaping fate The practice of Scyther was complex, involving elaborate rituals that allowed the vulva to enter trance states, communicate with spirits, and even travel to other realms. 
These rituals often took place in liminal spaces, such as on mountaintops, in groves, or at crossroads, where the boundaries between worlds were thin, and where magic was believed to be more potent. The Scythe Holler and the Circle of Chanting Women. A central feature in the Scythe ritual was the Scythe Holler, a raised platform or seat upon which the vulva would sit. The Scythe Holler symbolized the liminal space in a bridge between the physical world and the spirit world. The raised seat allowed the vulva to spiritually journey to other realms while remaining anchored in the mortal world. The ritual would begin with the vulva ascending the side holler, holding her staff as both a support and a symbol of her authority. Surrounding the side holler, a group of women known as side kulnar, side women, or attendants, would form a circle, chanting and singing the vard lokar, a special type of song or incantation meant to help the vulva enter the trance state. The chanting created a rhythmic and hypnotic environment, allowing the vulva to connect with the spiritual energies needed for her journey. The Vard Lokar were not just songs, they were considered magical spells in their own right, designed to summon protective spirits or guardian entities that could guide the vulva during her spiritual journey. These entities were believed to be crucial for a safe journey as the vulva could encounter hostile spirits, malevolent beings, or even lose her way in the other world. Soul Journeying and Spirit Communication Once in the trance state, the vulva could engage in what is known as soul journeying, where her spirit would leave her body and travel to other realms, such as Asgard, the realm of the gods, Hell, the realm of the dead, or the mysterious land of Alfar, the elves. This journey was a form of shamanic flight in which the vulva sought knowledge, guidance, or insight from otherworldly beings. In this state, the vulva could commune with spirits, ancestors, or gods to seek answers to specific questions posed by those who had sought her out. She might also encounter spirits of the land, known as Landvitr, or other entities like the Desir, female protective spirits who could provide information or offer warnings about the future. The vulva would then return from her spiritual journey, often delivering her visions in the form of poetic or cryptic messages. These prophecies were deeply respected and could influence significant decisions, such as going to war, moving a community, or making alliances. Her words were seen as coming directly from the divine or the ancestors carrying weight and authority. Saidr and the gods, Odin and Freya as practitioners. Two of the most significant figures in Norse mythology associated with Saidr were the gods Odin and Freya. Their use of Saidr underscores the importance and complexity of this magical practice, showing that it was not merely a human endeavor, but one that touched the divine. Odin, the All-Father and Master of Scyther. Odin, the chief of the Asir and the god of wisdom, war, and death, is one of the most well-known practitioners of Scyther. Unlike many of his divine counterparts, Odin was willing to engage in practices considered unmanly or dishonorable by others to acquire knowledge and power. According to the sagas, Odin learned the secrets of Scyther from Freya, the Vinir goddess of love, beauty, and fertility, who was also a master of this magical art. For Odin, the pursuit of wisdom and understanding was paramount, even if it meant stepping outside the boundaries of accepted behavior. He is often depicted as a wandering shaman, traveling between realms, seeking the wisdom of the runes, communing with the dead, and engaging in soul journeys to uncover the mysteries of the cosmos. His mastery of Scyther was primarily for gaining knowledge, shaping fate, and exerting influence over both gods and humans. Freya, mistress of magic and Scyther. Freya, one of the Vanir who resided with 
The Asir is often depicted as the foremost practitioner of Saith among the gods. Her mastery of this magic reflects her connection to both fertility and war, two realms where Saither could have profound effects. As a goddess of love and fertility, Freya Saither was often associated with matters of the heart, fertility rituals, and cycles of life and death. She was also known to use Saither in warfare, calling upon spirits and manipulating fate to influence the outcomes of battles. Freya's association with Scyther demonstrates its versatility and power in both realms of love and conflict. She was also known to ride in a chariot pulled by cats, an animal associated with independence and mystery, further emphasizing her role as a goddess who could navigate the delicate balance between different worlds. Freya's duality being both a nurturer and a fierce warrior reflects the very essence of Scyther itself, a force that could heal or harm, create or destroy. Her influence over this magic underscores its importance in Norse mythology and its integration into both the domestic and the martial aspects of life. Male Practitioners of Scyther Breaking Boundaries of Gender and Power While Scyther was traditionally associated with women, it was not exclusively their domain. Male practitioners, known as Scythemen, also engaged in this form of magic, though their participation was often, in, often viewed with ambivalence or outright suspicion. Oh, it looks like we've got another... another one. I really should have looked. I just copied and pasted what was sent. So let's see. Here we go. The pursuit of knowledge, power, or personal transformation was sometimes seen as worth the potential stigma. These men were solitary figures or operated on the fringes of society, utilizing their skills inside there for various purposes, whether for healing, prophecy, or personal gain. Loki, the trickster, and the ambiguous Scyther Mother. <clears throat> Loki the trickster, god of Norse mythology, represents the ambiguity and complexity of male practitioners of Scyther. While Loki is not always directly associated with Scyther, his shape-shifting abilities, deceitful nature, and propensity for manipulating events align with many of the characteristics attributed to Scyther. In the myths, Loki is known to cross both gender and species boundaries, transforming into various creatures and even giving birth after transforming into a mare. That's a good story. Loki's actions often serve to challenge and disrupt the established order, embodying the chaotic and unpredictable nature of Scyther. His presence in the myths suggests that male practitioners of Scyther, though controversial, were an acknowledged and integral part of the Norse magical landscape. The uses of Scyther, healing, warfare, weather, magic, and more. The versatility of Scyther made it a valuable tool for those who could master it. Its uses were as varied as the needs of the community or the individual encompassing everything from healing the sick to altering weather or even striking down enemies in battle. Scyther for healing and curses. Healing magic was a central aspect of Scyther. A skilled vulva <coughs> or Scythe mother could perform rituals to diagnose illnesses which were often thought to be caused by malevolent spirits, curses, or breaches of taboos. By entering a trance state, the practitioner could communicate with the spirits to identify the cause of the ailment and find the means to cure it. Conversely, Scyther could also be used to cast curses. These curses, known as Nid, were powerful spells that could bring misfortune, illness, or even death to an enemy. A practitioner might use Scyther to call upon spirits or the gods to enact vengeance or justice, 
and the effects of such curses were feared throughout Viking society. Weather manipulation and fertility. Scyther was also employed to control the elements, particularly the weather. In the harsh and unpredictable climate of Scandinavia, the ability to control rain, calm a storm, or ensure good sailing conditions was invaluable. A vulva, skilled in weather magic, could secure a bountiful harvest by summoning rain during a drought, or protect a seafaring crew by calming dangerous waters. Similarly, Scyther could be used to promote fertility and growth, both in terms of crops and human reproduction. Fertility rites often involved invoking Freya or other deities associated with abundance and life. These rituals could range from blessings and sacrifices to more elaborate ceremonies involving dancing, chanting, and the use of sacred herbs to encourage fertility. Scyther in Warfare In the realm of warfare, Scyther was used to influence the outcomes of battles either by instilling fear and confusion in the enemy, or by empowering one's own warriors with courage and strength. A famous example comes from the saga of the Inglings, where Queen Gida uses Scyther to curse King Harold and his men, leading them to act irrationally in battle. Warriors might call upon a Volva to perform Sitter before a raid, seeking omens and blessings for victory where they might employ Scythemen to place protective spells over their shields and weapons. The potential to alter the tides of battle through magic demonstrates the profound respect and fear the Norse had for Scythe practitioners, whose influence could extend to life and death itself. Scythe and Saga Literature The Saga of Eric the Red a compelling example of Scyther is depicted in the Saga of Eric the Red, which describes the arrival of the Volva named Thjordborg, known as the Little Prophetess, at a Greenlandic farmstead. Amidst a time of famine and hardship, Thjordborg is invited to perform Scyther to foretell the future and provide guidance for the community. Dressed in elaborate clothing and carrying a magical staff, Theodorborg is treated with the utmost respect. A platform is prepared for her ritual and she is surrounded by women who sing the Vardlokar to help her enter the trance state. In her trance, she communes with the spirits and delivers her prophecy, foretelling a prosperous future for the community once the famine has passed. This account highlights several key aspects of Scyther, the ritual preparation, the role of chanting and trance, and the cultural significance of the vulva as a bridge between the human and the divine. Dürerberg's prophecy brings hope and assurance to the people, demonstrating the practical and spiritual importance of the Scyther in Norse society. The risks and consequences of practicing Scyther. While Scyther could bring great power and respect, it also carried significant risks. The act of entering a trance and traversing the spiritual realms exposed the practitioner to unseen dangers. A vulva or side mother could encounter hostile spirits, malevolent beings, or get lost in the other world, potentially never returning to their physical body. Moreover, the social risks could be equally severe. Male practitioners of Scyther in particular faced accusations of ergi, a term implying unmanliness, weakness, or moral corruption. This accusation could result in social ostracism, loss of honor, or even violence. Women who practice Scyther could be similarly targeted if their prophecies were perceived as false, or if they were suspected of using their powers for personal gain. Despite these risks, Scyther continued to be a potent and respected form of magic throughout the Viking Age, reflecting the Norse people's belief in the interconnectedness of all things and their willingness to engage with the mysteries of the universe, even at a great personal cost. Conclusion Scyther and the Norse Worldview Scyther represents one of the most enigmatic and powerful forms of Norse magic, a practice that allowed 
its practitioners to step beyond the ordinary and into the realm of the divine, the spiritual, and the unknown. Through trance, spirit journeying, and communion with otherworldly forces, Saidar bridged the gap between humans and the unseen realms. Offering both wisdom and danger in equal measure, the use of Saidar by gods like Odin and Freya, as well as by humans such as the Volva and Saidman, underscores its significance in the Norse cosmology and society. It was a form of magic that could influence fate, heal the sick, control the elements, and determine the outcomes of battles. It was feared and revered, a testament to the Norse belief in a world where the seen and unseen were always intertwined, and where magic was a tool for navigating the complexities of life and fate. Through the lens of Scyther, we gain a deeper understanding of the Norse worldview, a world where the boundaries between the moral and the divine were fluid, and where magic, myth, and reality were inextricably linked. In the hands of the Volva and her staff, Saidar became a powerful expression of the Norse spirit, reaching out to the unknown and seeking to shape the very fabric of existence. So now we're on, we're going to do chapter 10, in the magic of war. Spells and charms on the battlefield. War was an ever-present reality in the Viking Age, a time when raiding, defending territories, and seeking honor in battle were central aspects of life. For the Norse people, combat was not only a physical confrontation, but also a spiritual one. The clash of swords, the thunder of shields, the roar of warriors were echoed in the realms of the gods and spirits. In this world, magic played a crucial role on the battlefield. Spells, charms, and rituals were as essential to the warrior's arsenal as his sword or axe, providing pr protection, strength, and victory, or instilling fear, confusion, and death in the enemy. This chapter explores the various forms of battlefield magic in the Viking Age, delving into spells, charms, and rituals that were believed to influence the outcomes of battle. It examines how warriors, chieftains, and magic practitioners wielded the forces of the unseen to protect themselves and their comrades, curse their foes, and ensure the favor of the gods. The Warrior's Worldview Fate, Honor, and the Divine To understand the role of magic in Viking warfare, it is essential to grasp the warrior's worldview. For the Norse, fate, wirt, was an unbreakable web woven by the norms, the spinners of destiny. Yet within this predetermined tapestry, there was room for personal agency and the manipulation of fate through courage, skill, and magic. Victory in battle was not just a matter of physical prowess. It was a sign of favor from the gods. Warriors believed that their fate on the battlefield was intertwined with divine will, particularly that of gods like Odin, Thor, Tyr, and Freya, who all had strong associations with war, victory, and death. To enter battle without invoking these deities through spells, charms, and rituals would have been unthinkable, as doing so could mean fighting without divine favor or protection. Spells for protection, shielding the warrior, before any battle, one of the primary concerns for a Norse warrior was protection. To go into battle without adequate magical protection would leave one vulnerable, not only to physical harm, but also to curses, spells, and spiritual forces wielded by the enemy. Thus, various spells, charms, and protective rituals were performed to shield warriors from harm. The Shield of Protection, Runes and Charms One of the most common forms of battlefield magic involved the use of runes, the sacred symbols believed to possess inherent magical powers. Runes were carved into shields, weapons, helmets, and even the bodies of warriors to invoke protection and strength. The Rune Algis associated with defense and protection was particularly favored. 
It was often inscribed on shields to create a protective barrier against physical and magical attacks. Runic inscriptions on shields and armor. Shields were a warrior's first line of defense. The runic inscriptions on shields were believed to create a protective aura. For example, the runes Algis, Tiawas, for victory, and Iwas, for resilience, were commonly combined into bind runes to amplify their protective properties. These runes would be carved into the shield's wood in a ritual involving the consecration of the shield with sacred oils or blood might follow to activate the magic. Helm Charms The Magic Helm of Awe The Agishyalmar, or Helm of Awe, was one of the most powerful symbols for protection and intimidation. This symbol was a complex vine room, typically worn or painted on the forehead or inscribed inside helmets to inspire fear in the enemies and protect the wearer from harm. It was believed to create a psychological and magical barrier, shielding the warrior from harm while striking terror into the hearts of opponents. The symbol's name itself reflects its power. Aegis means shield. Hjalmar means helm, combining the elements of protection and intimidation. Warriors who bore this on their armor or faces were taught to be invulnerable to the weapons and spells of their enemies. The belief in this protective power was so strong that warriors would chant incantations while tracing the symbol in the air before entering battle, invoking the protective spirit of the Helm of Awe to stand guard over them. Spells of Invincibility and Battle Frenzy Some spells were designed to enhance a warrior's natural abilities, pushing them to superhuman levels. These spells aim to invoke a state of berserking, or berserker, fury, a trance-like state in which warriors became impervious to pain, felt no fear, and exhibited extraordinary strength and endurance. The Berserkers and the Ulfidnar, warriors of Odin. Berserkers and Ulfidnar, wolf coats were legendary Viking warriors who wore the skins of bears and wolves into battle and were known for their ability to enter a state of uncontrollable rage. This state was believed to be induced by a combination of psychological conditioning, ritualistic practices, and possibly the use of psychoactive substances. The berserkers would chant battle hymns, invoke Odin's name, and perform ritual dances to stir themselves into a frenzy, becoming as strong as bears or bulls. These warriors were considered the epitome of war magic in action. In battle, they were believed to possess the spirit of the animal whose skin they wore, granting them not only its strength and ferocity, but also a magical resistance to weapons and pain. The frenzy could be so powerful that berserkers might even attack their own allies if not carefully controlled. Spells for invincibility, the rune urus, and shape-shifting magic to achieve this state of invincibility. Runes like urus, representing primal strength and vitality, were inscribed on weapons and armor. Warriors would also consume potions or inhale smoke from sacred herbs such as henbane or fly agaric mushroom, believed to bring them closer to the spirit of the animal they emulated. These preparations were often accompanied by incantations that invoked the power of Odin, Freya, and other gods associated with war and transformation. In addition to runes, certain spells involved calling upon animal spirits or shape-shifting magic to imbue warriors with supernatural abilities. The idea of becoming a bear, Mjorn, or wolf, Ulfr, was not just metaphorical, but a magical transformation where the warrior was thought to take on the attributes, senses, and instincts of these animals. This type of magic was deeply tied to the idea of a warrior's connection with their philia, 
spirit animal, believed to guide and protect them in battle. Offensive magic, spells to curse, confuse, and destroy the enemy. While protection was crucial, offensive magic was equally vital on the battlefield. The Norse believed that just as they could shield themselves from harm, they could also unleash powerful curses, spells, and spirits to decimate their enemies. Offensive spells were designed to weaken, confuse, or even kill foes, turning the tide of the battle in favor of those who wielded them. Cursing the enemy, Nidstang, rune magic, and the evil eye. Cursing the enemy was a common practice before and during battles. These curses were believed to have tangible effects, such as causing the enemy to lose their nerve, fall ill, or face misfortune on the battlefield. A curse could be directed at an individual enemy or the, an entire opposing force. The Nidstang, raising a curse pole against the foe. The Nidstang, or curse pole, was not only used for personal disputes, but also adapted for use in warfare. Before a battle, a chieftain or warrior might raise a Nidstang. Facing the enemy camp, inscribed with curses calling upon the gods, spirits, or ancestors to bring ruin upon the opposing forces. The pole would be topped with a carved animal head, often a horse, which had strong associations with death and the other world, and the inscribed curses would include threats of divine rep retribution, shame, or death. Accompanying the erection of the Nidstang, would be chants and incantations that called upon powerful deities like Odin or Loki to unleash chaos upon the enemy. The psychological impact of seeing a curse pole erected against them could demoralize the enemy, making them more susceptible to defeat. Rune magic to curse and confuse the enemy. Runic curses were another powerful weapon in the magical arsenal of the Norse warriors. Specific runes associated with chaos, destruction, and death were carved onto stones, weapons, or pieces of wood, and then hidden in places where they would influence the enemy's fate. For instance, the rune Thurizaz, associated with giants and destructive forces, could be carved on an object and buried near the enemy's camp to create discord and confusion. Runes could also be used to cause injury or death. The Hagalaz rune, representing hail or sudden disruption, was believed to cause storms, illness, or accidents. Warriors skilled in rune magic would inscribe these symbols onto arrows or spears, believing they would carry the curse directly into the enemy's ranks. The Evil Eye, casting fear and paranoia. The concept of the evil eye, a malevolent gaze believed to bring misfortune or harm, was also present in Norse war warfare. Warriors or sor sorcerers could cast the evil eye upon the enemy to instill fear, confusion, or paralysis. This was often done by staring intently at the target while reciting a spell or chant that called upon malevolent spirits to enter the enemy's mind. The evil eye was thought to be particularly effective when combined with symbolic gestures, such as pointing or waving a cursed object. Warriors who believed they were under the influence of the evil eye might lose confidence, make irrational decisions, or even flee the battlefield in panic. Storm and weather magic, controlling the elements, the Norse believed that the gods and spirits could control the elements, and through proper ritual and invocation, these forces could be harnessed to affect the battlefield. Weather magic was a potent form of offensive spell work that could summon storms, fog, or wind to disorient or even destroy the enemy. Invoking Thor's fury. Thunder and lightning in battle, Thor. The god of thunder and lightning was often called upon to unleash his fury upon enemies by performing a blot, sacrificial ritual, to Thor, enchanting spells that invoke his hammer, Molnir. Warriors believed they could summon a storm that would devastate the enemy ships or camps. 
This type of weather magic was particularly useful for naval battles, where a sudden storm could sink or scatter enemy fleets. Some accounts suggest that practitioners would perform rituals involving thunderstorms, believed to be the remnants of lightning strikes, and sacred herbs to invoke Thor's wrath. These rituals might include the burning of specific herbs or the consumption of a ceremonial drink, believed to connect the practitioners more closely to Thor's elemental power. The Summoning of Fog and Mist Deception on the battlefield Fog and mist were also powerful tools of war magic. The Norse believed that these natural elements could be summoned to confuse the enemy and provide cover for surprise attacks or retreats. The god Njord associated with the sea and winds, the goddess Hel, ruler of the underworld, were often invoked to summon mists that could obscure the battlefield or coastline. Warriors skilled in weather magic could chant spells, burn specific herbs, and make offerings to these deities, asking them to cloak the battlefield in darkness. The psychological effect of suddenly being enveloped in mist could cause panic and disorder in the enemy ranks, making them more vulnerable to attack. Rituals and Offerings for Victory Seeking the favor of the gods before any major battle, warriors and chieftains would perform rituals and make offerings to the gods to seek their favor. These rituals were essential for ensuring divine support and for preparing the warriors mentally and spiritually for the coming conflict. The Blot for Battle Sacrifices to the Gods of War the blot was the most common ritual for invoking the favor of the gods before a battle. During a blot, animals, usually boars, goats, or horses, were sacrificed to the gods, and their blood was sprinkled on the hof, temple. The altar and the participants is a blessing. The meat was then cooked and shared in a communal feast, strengthening the bonds between the warriors and reaffirming their commitment to their cause. Sacrifices to Odin, Thor, and Tyr. Odin, as the god of war, wisdom, and death, was often the primary deity invoked during these rituals. Warriors might offer a portion of their battle spoils, drink a toast in his honor, or even perform symbolic sacrifices that mimicked hanging, a reference to Odin's self-sacrifice on the Yldrasil to gain knowledge of the runes. Thor was also frequently called upon, particularly for his strength and protection. Rituals involving Thor would include offerings of ale or mead, the burning of sacred herbs like mugwort, and the invocation of Molnir, his hammer, to bless and protect the warriors. Tyr, the god of justice and war, was invoked for his courage and fairness in battle. His sacrifices might involve symbolic gestures of honor or commitment such as warriors pledging to uphold their oaths or fight to the death for their comrades. Tyr's association with self-sacrifice and fairness made him a favored god among those who sought honorable combat. Oaths and Vows Binding the Warrior Spirit to Victory Oaths were a powerful form of magical commitment in Norse culture, and before battle, warriors would swear Bragrful, or boasting cups to the gods, their ancestors and their comrades. This ritual involved drinking from a horn or cup and making a vow, often in the form of a boast, to achieve a particular defeat in the coming battle. The oath was considered binding and failure to uphold it could bring shame or even curses upon the warrior. The taking of oaths before battle was believed to invoke the power of the gods to witness and enforce the vow, strengthening the warrior's resolve and invoking divine favor. Breaking an oath could lead to dire consequences, such as losing haminga, personal luck, or incurring the wrath of the gods. Psychological Warfare Magic to instill fear and confusion in addition to physical and magical defenses, psychological warfare played a significant role on the battlefield. Instilling fear, confusion, and doubt in the enemy could weaken their resolve, making them easier to defeat. The power of the war cry, 
Galdar and shouting spells. The Galdar were chants or incantations used to focus magical energy, and they could be employed in battle to instill fear or courage. Warriors would chant or shout these spells as they charged into battle, creating a terrifying sound that was believed to carry magical power. The Galdar was not just a battle cry, but a weapon of sound that could disrupt the enemy's formation and morale. Shouting spells, known as Hurdr, were a form of magical incantation that called upon the gods, spirits, or ancestors to strike fear into the hearts of enemies. These spells might be chanted in rhythm with the beating of shields or drums, creating a, creating a hypnotic effect that amplified the psychological impact. The use of animal skins and masks. Transforming into fearsome beasts, warriors often wore animal skins, such as bears or wolves, into battle to invoke the spirit of these fearsome beasts. This practice was not just symbolic. It was believed to create a psychological transformation where the warrior would take on the attributes of the animal becoming more fearsome, aggressive, and resilient. Masks were also used in battle to create a sense of otherworldliness or to invoke the presence of a specific spirit or deity. These masks were often carved with grotesque or terrifying features intended to strike fear into the enemy by suggesting a supernatural presence. The Illusion of the Undead Summoning spirits to terrify the foe. The Norse believed that the spirits of the dead, particularly those who died violently or were not properly buried, could be summoned to haunt the battlefield. A skilled vulva or saidmother might invoke these restless spirits to create the illusion of an undead army rising to fight alongside them or to haunt the enemy's camp at night, causing sleeplessness, paranoia, and fear. These rituals often involved nighttime ceremonies, chanting, and the use of bones or other relics from the dead. The presence of these spirits could create a palpable sense of dread, leading to confusion and disarray among the enemy ranks. The role of the seeress and the war sorcerer. Strategic use of magic in warfare. In the Viking Age, warriors were not the only ones who wielded magic on the battlefield. The role of the vulva, seeress, and the scythe mother, war sorcerer, was crucial in guiding the strategic use of magic in warfare. The vulva, Prophecy and Strategic Guidance The vulva was a seeress, skilled in the art of scyther and prophecy. Her role in warfare was often to protect the outcome of battles, advise on strategic decisions, and perform rituals to gain the favor of the gods. Before battle, a chieftain might consult a vulva to determine the best course of action, or to foresee potential outcomes. The vulva would enter a trance-like state and often aided by chanting, rhythmic drumming, or the use of psychoactive herbs. During this trance, she could commune with the gods, spirits, or ancestors and deliver prophetic visions that could guide the warriors. The Scythe Mother, the Battlefield Sorcerer The Scythe Mother was a male practitioner of Scythe who specialized in offensive and defensive magic. Unlike the vulva, who focused on prophecy and divination, the Scythe Mother was often involved directly in the battle, using spells to confuse, curse, or destroy the enemy. The Scythe Mother might perform rituals to create illusions, such as making the enemy see double, or causing them to perceive their allies as enemies. He could also summon storms, fogs, or spirits to create chaos on the battlefield, the Scythe Mother was a master of deception, using his magic to turn the tide of battle in favor of his allies. Post-Battle Rituals Cleansing and Honoring the Fallen After the dust of the battle had settled, the work of magic was far from over. Post-Battle Rituals were essential for cleansing the warriors of the spiritual taint of bloodshed, honoring the fallen, and restoring balance between the living and the dead. 
cleansing rituals purifying the spirit. Cleansing rituals known as ablat were performed after battle to purify warriors from the spiritual pollution of death and violence. These rituals might involve bathing in sacred waters, fumigating with purifying herbs like sage or mugwort, and reciting chants that called upon the gods to cleanse and heal the spirit. The cleansing process was essential, not only for spiritual well-being, but also for maintaining Haminga, personal luck and ensuring that warriors could continue to receive divine favor in future battles. Honoring the fallen, sacrifices and offerings to the gods. The fallen warriors were honored through elaborate rituals that included sacrifices and offerings to the gods. The belief that by honoring the fallen, their spirits would be guided to Valhalla or other desirable afterlife destinations where they could continue to serve their gods and ancestors. Offerings might include food, drink, or even animal sacrifices made at the burial site or at a temple dedicated to a war deity like Odin or Thor. The spirits of the dead were believed to require sustenance and guidance, and these offerings were a way of providing for them on their journey to the afterlife healing spells and blessings for the survivors. Healing spells and blessings were also performed for the wounded and surviving warriors. These rituals could involve the laying on of hands, chanting of Galdr, or the use of herbal concoctions believed to have magical healing properties. The gods associated with healing, such as Ir or Baldr, were invoked to restore strength and health to the warriors, ensuring that they could fight again. The Legacy of War Magic Influence and Continuity in Norse Society The use of magic on the battlefield was not just a practical strategy, but a reflection of the deep-seated Norse belief in the interconnectedness of the spiritual and physical realms. For the Norse, the outcome of a battle was as much about divine favor and magical power as it was about strength and strategy. The continuity of war magic in folk traditions. Many elements of Norse war magic persisted into later Scandinavian folklore and even into the practices of modern day Norse paganism or Asa through the use of runes for protection and the invocation of deities for strength and courage continue to be practiced by those who seek to revive the old ways. Charms, chants, and symbols still hold power in modern spiritual and cultural contexts, reflecting the enduring legacy of Norse war magic and its deep roots in the human psyche. The Impact of War Magic on Norse Literature and Mythology The sagas and eddas are filled with stories of heroes, gods, and sorcerers wielding magic on the battlefield. These tales served as both entertainment and instruction, preserving the knowledge and importance of war magic for future generations. The stories of Odin's wisdom, Thor's strength, and the cunning of Loki continue to inspire and captivate, reminding us of a time when magic was as real as steel and as powerful as the gods. <clears throat> the Dance of Steel and Spell on the Viking Battlefield For the Norse, the battlefield was a place where the physical and spiritual realms converged, where the clang of steel was accompanied by the whisper of spells and where every warrior, chieftain, and seer had a role to play in the cosmic drama of life, death, and destiny. The magic of war spells for protection, curses for destruction, and rituals for victory was a fundamental part of this worldview, offering a means to control fate, seek honor, and commune with the divine. Through understanding the rich and complex tradition of Norse war magic, we gain insight not only into their battles, but into their souls, a people who embraced both the seen and the unseen, the blade and the blessing, in their quest for glory and survival. And that is all I have for you today. 
I am going to leave links to Cornelius's Facebook page where he also has um, an Etsy page as well. Please give, uh, go friend him and check out all of his work is fantastic. So, you know, take a look at that. He was so kind to let me read this to you. Um, when his book is available, please do think about actually purchasing it to support him and thank him for his kindness. Um, and check out all of his work. It's just really, uh, it's really great stuff. Highly recommend it. And Cornelius, if you watch this, thank you again. I greatly appreciate it. It's really fantastic. And thank you for letting me read it. If you have not, please subscribe to my channel. Um, I also made a new second channel. So if you like this kind of quiet, calm reading, for like when you go to sleep, I, I use that. So that's kind of why I do this. Um, if you like it, I made a second channel that's for creepier content like true crime and horror stories, ghost stories, things like that, uh, done kind of in the same style. I am learning how to edit videos, so I'm using that channel to kind of learn the editing process. So those videos are a little bit more edited, they're a little bit fancier. Uh, eventually I'll kind of bring that over to this channel once I get better at it but for now if you want to see that check it out on my other channel it is called Lily's Macabre Adventure um, yeah and so that's it like subscribe leave me a comment and let me know what you thought about this um, I'm sure that he will be checking as well so thank him uh, in the comments and I appreciate you thank you so much for all your support of my channel and I will end it there you guys have a lovely evening <laughs>